Anne Marie Schubert has been the District Attorney of Sacramento County since January of 2015. A veteran prosecutor for the DA's office since 1996, Schubert joins us to talk about her views on justice, the evolving role of her office, and her life as a career prosecutor. Next on Studio Sacramento. At Five Star Bank, we create thoughtful solutions to help the capital region thrive, from economic development and education to public health and safety, issues that are vitally important to Sacramento's prosperity. We're proud to be part of the conversation and hope you'll join in. does a citizen ever know whether or not the district attorney is doing a good job? Well, I think there's a lot of components to that. I mean, part of it is, you know, the DA's role is, you know, we're a public safety official. And so part of that is, are we putting bad guys in jail? That's kind of what people kind of look at us primarily for. But the other part about it, which I'm a huge believer in, is what do we do out in the community to prevent crime on the front end? Because you know, as a public safety official, I believe very strongly that public safety is about preventing it on the front end, as well as obviously prosecuting on the other end. But if we can prevent it on the front end, then we're all better off. And that's a, that's a pretty cool role that I like to have. That's an interesting way to describe the role. Where do you think the basis of crime from an environmental standpoint, where does it come from? Well, I think, I mean, it's taken me, you know, I've been in this job for 25, 26 years. And when you really step back and look at it, I mean, my own opinion after years of doing this is that a lot of it's re essentially rooted in raising healthy families, whatever a family looks like. That's simple. Well, I think because I think if you, at least from a crime perspective, you know, um, if, ki if kids are given a healthy upbringing, you know, they go to school, they, um, they're not, they don't suffer from poverty. They have good role models. They have opportunities and um, they stay in school. Those kinds of things, they, they're not abused or neglected. Because I've spent many, many years in my career dealing with, with children that have been the victims of abuse or neglect. And oftentimes when children are uh, victims of abuse or neglect, then they go on to either become victims or, or potentially perpetrators. And so if we can stop that um, as young as they are, uh, we're all going to be better off. That child, that family, that neighborhood, that community, and ultimately um, we're healthier. It's an interesting perspective. How is it that in your office you're able to impact some of those conversations about raising healthy families and by extension healthy communities? Well, I'll give you an example. Before I got lucky and got this job, I was supervising uh, what we call our misdemeanor unit. And when I, when I got in that unit, we, had, um, we would prosecute cases involving truancy. You know, my life was about murders and rapes and child abuse. And I'm like, I, I decided that, you know what, I want to understand this dynamic better. Why is the DA's office, why is it getting to this point? Why has it gotten to this point? And so, you know, ultimately after doing research, not just, you know, in California, across the country, if you really look at it as a greater picture, you know, 85% of the prison population is comprised of people that either dropped out of school or were chronically truant. So I tried to take a, you know, step back and say, okay, what can we do to help this? What can we as DAs? And really what we developed, which I'm really proud of, was let's get into school sooner as a DA. Okay, as a parent, that's a separate issue, but as a DA, what can we do? And so we've developed this great program in Sacramento County called uh, PACT, Partners Against Chronic Truancy, where we partner with people that we don't normally partner with, the public defender, uh, the courts, the Department of Human Assistance, and we go out to schools, we, you know, we ask schools to tell us who, wh where are we having issues with kids at the beginning of the stages of truancy. And we bring them in and we try to encourage them, And because I really believe very strongly that every parent, no matter what the lock, walk of life they live, wants a better life for their child. It's innate, That's, we, we all want it. Sure. And so if we can impact them when they're in first grade, second grade, third grade, long before they've ever gotten to the point of ever coming to our office, then we're all better off. 
well, get, get behind that effort a little bit and share with us a little bit about what you've learned about some of the causes of truancy that maybe may not necessarily be intuitive to the rest of us. Well, there's a lot of reasons. I mean, there, it could be poor parenting skills. It could be drug addiction. It could be mental health issues. It could be that particular child has medical issues. Maybe that child's being bullied. There's a whole host of reasons why. Um, at the end of the day, it's the parent's responsibility to get that child to school. But as a community, what can we do together to help encourage that child to get to school? And so um, there's many, many reasons why ch a, a child may be late. I mean, it may be a kid that's defiant. Um, maybe he or she doesn't, you know, goes to school, parent drops them off, you know, she cuts out the back door, whatever. Um, but for us as, as public safety folks or community folks is what can we do as a community to help in that situation and encourage um, that family to get that child to school? Do give us kind of a sense of the breadth of what the DA does? Um, it's more than probably most people, you know, some people you might ask them, what does a DA do? They, are you the one that defends them? Um, you know, most people that, that know what a DA does, their, their first thing is, oh, you put the bad guys in jail. That's true, that's, that's the core function. If some, we are reactionary, that's how I look at it. But the, but the function of the DA's office is much, much wider than that. And this is long before I ever became the DA. I mean, Jan Scully created some incredibly innovative programs to go out into the community. Um, we have, so on the prosecution side, you know, do some bad guys go to jail? Absolutely. Is that always going to happen? Absolutely. But there's many things we do, even in the court system, to try to divert folks out of jail, mental health court, veterans court, drug court, those kinds of things, because we want people to get the help they need. But what do we do long before we even get to a courtroom? We go out into the community. We, we have programs like um, DUI in the classroom. We have what we call iSmart, going out and educate kids on the dangers of social media. We have a program trying to teach kids on the dangers of drugs. We have a youth academy. so we educate kids. We partner again with all these law enforcement, public defender, probation to educate kids about what is the justice system all about. Let's, let's tell them what it's about. Let's have the challenging conversations. Um, let's encourage them that maybe they want a life, a job in this career. What, what do you think is the essential purpose of the justice system? Oh, well that's a pretty broad question. I mean it's, the justice system in my view is well, I look at it as a public safety system, but um, one, to right the wrongs that have been committed against the citizens of our community, to stand up for victims. Okay, if I'm the victim of a crime, I want someone to be my voice. Um, th that's a key component. Um, another component of it is to, to make sure that if folks, you know, go down a wrong path and they make a bad decision, that not only do we hold them accountable, but we give them the tools to get themselves back on the right path. You know, I, I said this earlier today to somebody else, is, you know, we have to recognize that if somebody goes to prison, overwhelming percentage are coming out someday, as well they should, 95% or something like that. We have an obligation in the justice system to make sure that they have the skill set and the rehabilitation that they need so that when they come out, they can lead that healthy life. That's a, that's a very different point of view than was held commonly in law enforcement circles, say, 20 years ago or so, where sort of the predominant theme of, of that era, some would say, um, would be, let's lock them up, let's not do anything with them, and let's just get them old enough within the system to where they're too old to commit a crime. I, I'm not sure that that's what I'm hearing from you. I'm hearing no, a bit of a different my, approach. No, I mean, my philosophy is there are some people, trust me, that need to go to prison and need to stay there. Okay, that's just the way that's going to be. Um, and I'm not going to change on some of those, you know, we get these people like, you know, hardcore sex offenders, murderers, rapists, those kinds of folks. But then there's this other part of the population that people have committed very, you know, some very bad crimes. Um, maybe they get 10, 15 years. Um, but we have an obligation, but they're going to come out. And they should come out. But they should come out with the skills that they need because whether they're 50 years old, 60 years you know, they still have to live. They still have to have a job or support themselves. And they may well have children. And they may have people that they have an impact on. So if we can help them 
get themselves back on track. Again, it, to me, it's, 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 it's almost like paying it forward. If you uh, independently were empress of California. I'm and, not going to be interested in being empress. <laughs> <laughs> and, could, and could make a few fundamental changes in order to accomplish the end you just described of when people come out that they could, their position to be productive. Right. What do you think the, those things would be that you would enact? Provide the funding that we need to get these people the help that they need. Because, I mean, I, you know, I give credit, like our Sacramento County probation is phenomenal, okay? They do tremendous work. But they have to have the resources to be able to do all that work. The same is true with the Department of Corrections. I mean, so, you know, it's not cheap to provide this rehabilitation. I mean, because people have, you know, they, many of them that end up in prison have had terrible lives, and so they've got many issues that need to be addressed. And that's not something that's just you give them medication for. This is something they have to get to their root causes of what their challenges are. You know, a person that has a drug problem, it probably takes 12 to 18 months of rehabilitation to really get them back out of that lifestyle to the point that we feel like, okay, they're not going to relapse. It takes funding. So to me, you got to have the right balance. You got to have the balance of accountability. You have to have the balance of rehabilitation, but that rehabilitation needs to be meaningful. So if I was, I don't want to say empress, but if I was queen for a day, you know, I would, I would try to find that balance so that we're not having this pendulum go one way or the other way. Because that doesn't solve, it really doesn't solve the problem. I mean, I don't want to lock them all up, but I also don't want to just decriminalize everything to the point that our society becomes lawless. Well, one of the, one of the recent initiatives, right. Prop 47 that passed, reduced sentences for a, a certain bandwidth of offenders. Yes. What's been your perspective on that, the implications of implementing that proposition? I think it's had terrible implications on California. I was a vocal opponent of it before um, it passed. And, and I, I understand the intent behind it, which was, hey, most people that steal have drug problems. Okay, that's probably true. But to me, the solution is not to essentially decriminalize them. I mean, it's you know, we've reduced the penalties to the point that it's almost like decriminalization. And so, you know, if you go out into the community and you ask folks, I mean, to me, it's a terrible thing for somebody to use drugs, okay? It's even, f it's far worse if somebody chooses to go out and victimize somebody else. So they, they go from store to store to store and they steal $900 worth of goods. I mean, that, and then essentially there's no consequences for them. That's not helping that community and that's not helping that individual. And so the implications have been huge. I mean, it's just, you know, there's essentially no stick anymore to try to encourage folks to go to, um, to treatment. Well, it raises a question as to, is there a relationship between Prop 47 and an and earlier bill, I believe it was AB 103 that, that moved people from- 109. 109, 109. 109. yes. Thank you. Yep that moved people from the state prison system back into right. local right. facilities. Right. And uh, years ago, we had uh, the sheriff of Sacramento County on, mm -hmm. and Sheriff Jones said, hey, you know, the thing is, is don't give us responsibility without- Money. That's right. That's right. And so if you look at these two things in tandem, one might conclude that um, this is a way of sort of economically, from an economic perspective, rationalizing um, the, this action in reducing costs on one hand, mm -hmm. but maybe you're squeezing in a balloon that'll pop out on the other side. Well, and when, when anybody talks about costs or savings, oh, we're going to save all this money from incarceration, what about the costs of what happens to our community? What about the cost for the society of the victim? No one ever counts the cost to that victim. So the, you know, the guy that has his um, tools stolen from his truck, that's his livelihood. That's how he makes his living. No one ever counts that cost. How about the lost wages? How about the loss of, of business opportunities, whatever it is? And so, you know, it's from an economic point of view, you have to look farther than just the pure cost of how much a bed costs in a jail. Do you have a perspective as well on the continuing efforts on the decriminalization of marijuana? Uh, we've. I had do have a. I do have a pretty 
uh, clear opinion, which is I think that it's, I, I say this and I mean it, is what is the good public policy from decriminalizing marijuana? Not, money doesn't count. Greed doesn't count. Um, and so my philosophy, again, it kind of goes back to kids because I really believe it has a, a, a negative impact on the, our youth. It takes away the stigma. Um, and then you look at other states like Colorado, and I look at the fact that they have twice as many pot shops as they do Starbucks. Really? Yes. And the poorest neighborhoods in Colorado are the ones that are most affected by that, by the, by the, by the pot dispensary. So let me, let me get a reaction from you on this. Um, you talk about what is the, the, the purpose, right. policy purpose served. There are some cynics who say, well, we, the, all of these people are locked up for, some of them, for selling marijuana years ago. They're still incarcerated. The same activities that uh, they were incarcerated before, uh, years ago for, now there are tales of people who are engaged in that industry as being sort of pioneering entrepreneurs, making it the American way. And it, it seems that it's, mm -hmm. it's a bit ironic that a set of activities that caused many people to get locked up for now in some ways has become uh, something that is celebrated or as a new aspect of the entrepreneurial spirit of California. Well, in terms of people locked up, first of all, there's nobody in prison for possessing marijuana. I'd be curious if you did a Public Records Act request to see. No, CCR. selling. Selling, yes, but there people go to prison not simply because of the crime, but because of their past as well. So I'd be curious to see how many people are in prison for selling drugs, selling marijuana as a standalone, and they got nothing else in their past. Because I would predict that's I would predict that that's zero. But w wasn't it traditionally prosecuted as a felony? Possession for sale of marijuana? Yes. Okay. Yes. So those people... That still is a felony. I mean, I, and I will say this, you know, I, and I tell this to my kids, marijuana does kill. I mean, it does in the sense that we have a large number of homicides or uh, home invasion robberies in Sacramento County where people are robbing or killing over either the drug itself or the value. So, and I say this, and I mean this, is that marijuana, whether you legalize it or not, will have value. It has value. People steal, people kill because something has value. And legalizing it, I don't think some folks are going to suddenly wake up tomorrow and decide they're going to pay taxes. <laughs> I don't mean that to sound sarcastic, but there's going to be a black market. People think, oh, we're going to get rid of the black market. But, you know, the federal government doesn't recognize this. There's and, still a black market for cigarettes in some parts of the country. That's right. There is. And so I think that there's going to be, you know, I think there's some folks out there that don't want to pay taxes on marijuana. So they're going to buy it elsewhere. So, I mean, that's, to me, that part of it is a small component. I look at it as a bigger issue of what impact does this have on the future of California and what impact does it have on the poorest neighborhoods of our community? Let's talk about poverty for a second. Okay. A lot of discussion going on these days about what's called the criminalization of poverty. And that is that um, government, okay, and, and you are an agent of the government. I'm the government. You are the government, <laughs> okay. Prosecute people, but there's a disproportionate impact on prosecutions. Uh, and the ability to move past them. There, for instance, one thing that, that uh, I think everyone watching this program has experienced as a citizen is you get a, a, a traffic ticket, mm -hmm. and the traffic ticket has a fine, and fine, the you know? The penalties are 200%. Yes, but then there's this thing called the penalty assessment, and you're trying to figure out what the heck is the penalty assessment? And those sorts of things while it is that a, a person of means can afford to deal with that, lower income people end up suffering sure. worse and worse and worse yes, outcomes. They get, into a, they get into a cycle that is very difficult to get out of because it's, I mean, it is. It's, I mean, it's, I, I would not say it's decriminalization or criminalization of poverty. I mean, as a DA, our job is to, if somebody commits a crime, we look at the facts, we don't 
I don't look at who the person is, where they live, what their economic status is. Did they commit this particular crime and can we prove that beyond a reasonable doubt? Um, does that mean that there's not more crime in certain areas? No, not necessarily, obviously, but that's, I don't think you can blame it on the fact that we file cases. Um, I don't know really how else to answer that. I mean, we, we file cases based upon the facts of a case. Well, the, the, the charges, what, what really gets to the root of the charge is that there are two systems of justice one for, and I'm sure you take umbrage of this, but one for low-income people and one for people of means because low-income people cannot necessarily afford to use every single potential tool that's available in order to represent themselves within a system. Well, I mean, pe people have a, have a constitutional right to a appointed attorney. And I will give kudos to our public defender's office because they're very good at what they do. I mean, to me, I want, if somebody makes a, a mistake, commits a crime, um, I want them to have the best representation they have because, one, they deserve it, but two, that's the, what the system should have. Um, does it mean that bad things don't happen to people that, make, that commit crime? No. There should be accountability. Sure. I mean, there's no question on that. Um, does that mean that we don't try to do things you know, somebody comes through the system, you know, that's why we have like a lot of alternative courts, things like that, so that we can help facilitate. But there's got to be accountability, no matter what anybody's walk of life is. Let's talk a little bit about some of those tools that, that have been used, um, not only to bring justice, but also to um, improve process. You've been a leader on the use of DNA uh, testing particularly with regards to cold cases. Tell us why you think that tool is so important. Well, I mean, I, I'm very passionate about DNA. I've been involved in it since the mid-90s. Um, I believe very strongly it's the greatest tool ever given to law enforcement to find the truth, no matter what it is. Because in, in my world, what matters is what is the truth is. Um, it may exonerate folks. It may incriminate folks. It may... Um, be circumstantial evidence in a particular case. So I find it incredibly powerful. I mean, just if you just look, like when I was in the early 2000s, we started a cold case homicide unit. We have a lot of cases. We have a little lady named Mrs. McAllister who was brutally raped and murdered up in the Del Paso Heights area. But for DNA and but for collecting a sample from a guy, that case would never have been solved. And so uh, it's a powerful tool. We have had other cases where you know, our lab looks at something and says, nope, that's not the guy. we got the East Area Rapist out there that's committed these horrific crimes, never been caught. And our lab is looking at stuff all the time. And if it's not the guy, it's not the guy. Move on. The, uh, this, this tool has been used, as you say, right. not just to convict, but to exonerate. Yes. Uh, there's, there's kind of a mixed review, though, because for, for all the exonerations that sometimes hit the press, it seems that there's, at least on the part of folks like the Innocence Project, mm -hmm. a, a concern that prosecutors sometimes getting a, a DNA uh, evidence uh, check that says that the, the person that they have convicted of a particular right. crime could not have been the person seems to resist uh, um, the consideration of that evidence. I, don't, I, I can only speak for myself. I mean, first of all, it, it depends on the facts, okay? So I, let's say you got a guy that got convicted and he's, he's got Innocence Project saying, oh, we want you to do DNA testing. Well, what are you wanting us to do it on? On the cigarette butt that was found 50 feet away? Or is it on the, the vaginal swab collected from the rape kit? I mean, that's a difference that I can understand why there might be like, what is that? What is the relevance of that evidence? Sure. But I can speak from my own personal experience as ha having um, overseen what we call the post-conviction testing in our office. Um, we are very cooperative when it comes to working with groups post-conviction. And I would venture to guess that the Innocence Project will tell you that in working with me, um, you know, for me, I just want the truth. That's it. That's what I look for. Um, haven't seen a case in Sacramento County where DNA has led to, the, um, to an exoneration of somebody that wasn't, wasn't, wasn't guilty. Let's turn to uh, one of the, the new phenomenons that's been going on, uh, cyber crimes, mm -hmm. things like cyberbullying, right. uh, sexting, and other things. Yep. 
difficult situations, uh, two teens, both underage, uh, sending each other pictures. Yeah. How do you process? Poor decisions. I, uh, how do you deal with that in our, in our Well, families? I think it's, I mean, I, I think the first part is trying to get out there and educating these kids, which what we do. I mean, it's a different world than when we were kids. I mean, we didn't, um, we didn't have Facebook or Instagram or Snapchat or whatever they all are now, but kids need to understand that these are permanent parts of their life now that is out there and could impact their education, their college recruitment, their job prospects, and so we should be telling them. And I, we're going to leave it there. Okay. Thank you very much. Oh, you're welcome. And that's our show. Thanks to our guest and thanks to you for watching Studio Sacramento. I'm Scott Syfax. See you next time right here on KVIE. At Five Star Bank, we create thoughtful solutions to help the capital region thrive, from economic development and education to public health and safety, issues that are vitally important to Sacramento's prosperity. We're proud to be part of the conversation and hope you'll join in. All episodes of Studio Sacramento, along with other KVIE programs, are available to watch online at kvie.org video.